Hey everyone, it's Clever Zodiambo here and in this video I'm going to be talking about light and shadow and how to use this in drawing and painting. This is going to be a repetition of a lesson I gave earlier at the University of Nairobi School of the Arts and Design. So if you are part of that class and you're watching this, you can use it as a refresher course. But of course to make it worth your while, I've added a few more tidbits and a bit more information that will make it easy for you to use light and shadow in your art. A good starting point of this is to understand how does light interact with objects. Like if you have some rays of light coming in from a certain direction, let's say from this part of the screen, and you have an object over here, which parts are going to be bright and how bright are they going to be and how do you determine such a thing. It's advisable that we first start by simplifying these objects into planes. Then you can think of it as though we're just lighting a bunch of planes. And by planes, in this case, I mean flat two-dimensional surfaces. So this is an example of a plane, this piece of paper over here. If we look at it at an angle, it's still a plane. If we look at it in perspective, it's still a plane. If you fold it into two, then we have two planes. If you're trying to shed a curve that looks like this, and you have light coming in from some angle, understanding planes would make it easy for you to tell which section of this curve should be lit the brightest and which section won't be. Again, thinking of our piece of paper, let's say we folded it into three and we have light coming in from this direction. So these are light rays. If you're trying to figure out how to light such an object, it may be confusing at first because you may be thinking, well, clearly we have these two surfaces receiving a lot of light. But how do you tell which of these two surfaces will be brighter than the other? Because you have light coming in from a direction that clearly lights them both. Well, let's extend these rays of light to kind of hit our objects. Okay, now let's isolate this corner and use it as a hook, as a guideline to show us how light is going to behave around this object. The way to tell which of these planes is going to be brighter than the other is by figuring out which one light hits at an angle that's closest to a 90 degree angle. So in this case, this one clearly is. This one not so much. As you can see, light hits it at an obtuse angle. The light doesn't actually touch any of this plane, so this one stays dark. I mean, that's an easy one to figure out at first. So now this won't be as dark as this one. Let's just draw it again. So now we're gonna shade the first plane with something close to white. The second one with the slightly darker version of this kind of white. And the third plane with an even darker version. We'll just make it slightly darker than the paper then. So this is how light behaves in the planes that it hits. But how does it behave in the planes that it doesn't hit? What exactly happens in a shadow region? Because a lot of the times you'll find somebody draws something like a sphere and if light is coming in from this direction again they'll just shade one side of it dark which is kind of correct but what exactly happens in this section of that sphere let's go back to a piece of paper let's say this is the surface on which the paper sits in this case i'm gonna fold it into many more planes so this is our light coming in from this direction the brightest plane is generally going to be that which light hits at the angle closest to the perpendicular. So just assume this is a piece of paper that's been folded many times over here. Yeah? So I'm focusing on this particular face of the um, side rather of this piece of paper. So that's what we have up here in case you're wondering what this is. That would mean this face over here will be the brightest. So we're gonna make that white. So this face or this plane that we just shaded white is what is called a highlight. This plane is also going to receive light, but it's receiving it at an acute angle and not at a 90 degree angle at a normal. So in as much as it's going to get some light, it won't get as much light as the highlighted section will. So it's not going to be as bright. This face is also being hit at an obtuse angle. I tend not to remember the difference between an obtuse and a reflex angle. The more the angle shifts towards 180 degrees, the less the amount of light you're going to receive. You know what, I'm so sorry about this, but I have to do it right about now. I'm gonna change the color of this page to something that will make what we're drawing a bit more visible. All these faces that are receiving light, but are not as bright as the highlights, these faces are called the midtones. Now we're done with all the faces of this object that are being hit by the light. Now we have all these other planes that are not being hit by any light. So these are simply known as the shadows. So we're just going to paint them black for now. 
But is the shadow of any object really completely dark all the way or does something similar to what happens in the lit section happen in the shadows where we have some sort of gradation from kind of light to really bright to kind of light again to light but not as light before it transitions into the shadows. Do we have a similar thing happening in this other side? Sometimes we don't and that's only in cases where we have no reflected light whatsoever. So in the case of the moon, for instance, if you have the moon over here and sunlight is coming in from this direction, since the moon is suspended in space, for the most part, there's nothing to reflect light back to this dark side of the moon. Then the shadow of the moon will be a perfectly dark section of this sphere. But for most things that are on this planet, there's normally going to be some sort of reflection. Actually, there are times when the Earth is just perfectly situated behind the moon, but some of the sunlight hits the earth, then gets bounced back onto the moon. So you can actually see this part of the moon being lit as well. as a situation called earth shine. So if you look up this word earth shine, you're going to see some cool pictures of the dark side of the moon being lit. All right, so let's paint in something like a wall. In fact, let's give this wall a color. When light from our source hits this wall, some of the light gets absorbed into the wall as it gets absorbed into everything else, into this object, into other objects around it. But then what happens, since it absorbs some of the light, the light that gets reflected back onto our object is going to be incredibly weak. So we're going to have light bouncing from this wall back to our object. And even as it bounces off the floor, it's going to bounce again onto the object. I mean, light doesn't stop bouncing. Most of the light you see around you is actually reflected light if you think about it. A reflected light is usually so weak that it only makes a difference on the shadowed regions of an object. A reflected light cannot be visible on this side that's lit by the direct source. But a reflected light will work in the exact same way which is it's going to be the brightest at those sections where it hits our object at a right angle. And in our case this is going to be the brightest of the reflected rays but then it will get even less bright on this plane and even less bright on this other plane over here. So the information we have so far is that in the light section we're gonna have highlights and midtones. And in the shadowed section we're gonna have shadows. Actually this is called the core shadow. The darkest part of any shadow is called the core shadow. And the line that separates the light section from the shadowed section is called the terminator. So we're gonna have the highlights and the midtones in the light section and in the shadowed section we're gonna have the core shadow and the reflected light. Just to make this a bit clearer, I'm going to paint in a few colors over here. Highlights. And let's use this one as a mid-tone. Then you have the core shadow. This is the darkest section. And the reflected light. Let's use that one as the reflected light. Reflected light, like I said, can never be as bright as any of the sections in the light section because it's incredibly weak, being that it's hitting another object, losing some of its energy in absorption, then finally releasing weaker rays of that light back. So for that reason, you're never going to have reflected light being as bright as any of these sections. So this light, if you place it here, you can see it's much darker. So do not make the mistake of painting reflected light as, as bright or brighter than, than the direct light unless the light is being reflected off of a mirror which will give back almost 100% of the light or unless instead of reflected light you have another light source on that other side of your object. So let's transfer this information into a more practical arena and see how this actually works in real life. Let's say we're painting a cylinder for instance. Eh? So these are the sides of the cylinder. Maybe the top is some sort of an ellipse and the bottom as well. In this case it would be half an ellipse. Well if you're having trouble figuring out how to color a cylinder like this, what would make it easier is to imagine it's been divided into planes. I'm going to have light coming in from this side again. Don't worry, in some of the examples I'll bring in light from other angles. So, if light is coming in from this angle, then this is going to be the brightest. By the way, why is it that the plane or the face that's being hit at a 90 degree angle is going to be the brightest? Let me just illustrate something to you real quick, which will give you a better idea of why this is. So you don't just memorize it as a rule, but you actually understand how exactly this kind of stuff works. So if you have light rays coming in parallel to each other, and let's say we have an object cutting through these light rays. So the object goes up here, then falls again. 
well how many rays are hitting this 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 face how many rays are hitting this plane we have one two three four and five so we have five rays hitting this plane how many rays are hitting this plane over here one two and how many are hitting this plane over here one so the further away from from a 90 degree angle you go when it comes to how a light ray interacts with a plane the darker is going to appear so if you are shading this object and you give this plane an intensity of five you would maybe figure out some way to make it two in this other plane then some way to cut that into half to make it one on this plane anyway back to our cylinder how are you going to light this thing this plane over here will be hit the brightest then next up we won't get as much light but we'll still get some light let's imagine the top the top view of this cylinder looks something like this and we have light coming in from this direction so the face that we just lit white was this face over here and now when we move on to the next color we're talking about maybe a, a plane that we've imagined here and now we're going over to this one so that would be the, the mid-tone which in this example will be somewhere here but then you notice and it's clearer in the top view from somewhere close to the center the light is no longer touch our object so from here onwards all we're gonna have is shadow so we could even go ahead and just color it in as total shadow then afterwards we can decide if there's something reflecting the light back how exactly that is going to behave so let's say we have a wall we have all these rays hitting this object at that angle they're gonna get bounced back as very weak red rays because some of them get absorbed then this wall is going to give back light of the red wavelength and because from the top view again if this is our red wall over here light is going to be hitting this object at a right angle somewhere close to the middle so the middle plane would be this one over here but it won't even be as bright as the wall so let's just darken it a lot more than it actually is right now it is something like that then the more you move towards the center the more of an angle the light is going to hit this object until just like we did with the direct lighting right at the center the reflected light will stop getting to the surface of our cylinder so this part won't have any reflected light on it let's continue with our painting and have just a little of it on this face and little to no reflected light where we have our core shadow let's erase all these lines we used to when you converted it into a plane so when you're lighting a cylinder what you then do is you simply blend in all these colors so that you have a kind of smoother transition even smoother than what i'm doing here so this is how light is going to behave the darkest section won't always be at the at the very end a lot of the times if you have light being reflected it's going to brighten some of this part sometimes there could be a few more details that could make it look even more interesting like maybe this some light being reflected off of something else in the room so if it's a metal cylinder for instance you'll see this kind of thing going on you could even do the same with the darker color just depends on what's around the room it's going to reflect so many things if it's a shiny kind of cylinder but if you're painting from imagination then a lot of this is just going to be i'm gonna call it guesswork but still with some sort of system whereby you know how light behaves around such an object it's less of guesswork and more like you actually know what you're doing so now let's paint maybe the top of the cylinder then we're going to be done with it so the top of the cylinder is also being hit at an angle so it won't be white so we'll just give it this color over here so if the light is coming from this angle you find that the corner is probably going to be a bit bright there's going to be something like this going on in the corner so let's do something similar with the sphere this time let's bring the light in from the opposite direction so this is a representation of the light rays which plane or which part of the surface of this sphere is being hit perpendicularly but they, i know i'm talking about planes and when i started i said planes are flat surfaces but now we're talking about a sphere so why am i describing it as a plane because if you're lighting up a sphere you can think of the sphere as if it's a ball that's made of many different planes you don't have to but it's a good starting point if you have trouble figuring out how to light 3d objects let's make it white that's how i'm going to be representing these brightly lit sections of these things we're painting today then the deeper you go into the ball uh, the less bright the mid-tones are going to look 
So I'm just going to keep doing this till you get to the halfway point. And the reason why I'm gonna have to stop using these bright colors at the halfway point is because at that point, the light stops hitting the surface of the ball. And you may notice this halfway line that you just drew here is exactly perpendicular to where the light is coming from. Which means if you had, say, three different spheres, just as an example, and we were lighting them from different angles, say from here, from here, uh, maybe this one comes from straight from the top, then you would have the light rays from this beam stopping somewhere here. Like this is the last part where they're going to hit the sphere. And so this will be the separation between light and dark. And for the second sphere, we would have it look something like this. So once again, this would be the separation. And for this one again, it would probably go horizontally like that. So once again, since this is where the light stops hitting our object, it's just going to get dark from here. Since it's a sphere, by the way, I'm not painting all these lines in a straight fashion as I did for the cylinder. I'm kind of curving them to, to show that kind of movement of how a sphere looks like. So if there isn't anything reflecting light from the back, then this is the end of how we shed our sphere. But for practice purposes, let's imagine there's a wall. So our light rays were coming in from this angle, remember? The moment they hit this wall, they bounce back. They had exactly the same angle as that at which they came in, as very weak yellow light. That part of the sphere that's being hit at a perpendicular angle by this reflected rays is going to be the brightest. Then all the rest will follow accordingly. So we're just going to paint them very lightly because once again reflected rays are really weak so they won't really make much of an impact just like that. So let's make it look like an actual sphere by erasing a lot of this stuff and try and make them blend in into each other. Then let's get rid of the excess. One way you can practice how to play around with light is to start by painting your light source. You can then paint in a bunch of spheres around our light source and figure out how light will interact with them. I'm starting by painting the light section, then I'll paint in the shadowed section afterwards. So this is going to be a mirror image of the other one on the other side. This three are going to be a bit different. We won't be able to see most of it. So looking in from the back. Okay, for this one we'll just see something called a rim light, which is kind of the way a crescent moon is formed. And this will be a mirror image of this one over here. Now, if we decide that there's something reflecting the light from the other side, then I'm just gonna add that at the back. But like I said, reflected light probably won't be that bright. So it'll just be a hint of a reflection. For the ones at the top, we're only going to be able to see the core shadow. We won't be able to see the reflected light. Sometimes you can find that the reflection of these balls show up on each other's surfaces. So in this case, maybe you can only see some of the rim lights. There we have a rim light and maybe some slight reflection at the back. Then let's erase the excess so it looks as halfway presentable as all the other marbles around this candle. Let's now color one other marble a different color so I can show you how colors interact with each other. So let's change the color of this one to maybe something like yellow. So we're going to have the same phenomenon happening up here whereby it's going to be well lit towards the top because you're looking at it from the back. It's going to have its shadowed region mostly towards the back. I've left this part at the back over here not as dark because I'm assuming there's something reflecting the light back onto the surface of the sphere. So now let me erase some of the excess paint so we're left with nothing but the sphere. And so what I wanted to show you in this section was what exactly happens when two items of different colors are next to each other like this. The way we see color is something like white light, the, like the kind of white emanating from the center of this, um, of this group of marbles. 
this light is made of different wavelengths of light. All the colors of the rainbow are in white light. So it's releasing light in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all that stuff. But an object that's yellow in color will absorb every other wavelength, but then give back or reflect the yellow wavelength. A marble or an object of a color that's between yellow and green will absorb all the other wavelengths, then give back a mix of green and yellow wavelengths. And that's how we'll see something like this kind of yellowish green at the, at the back over here. But a dark object like this marble to this side will absorb most if not all of the light. So the darker it gets, the less light is going to be reflected from the surface of this marble. Which means when these three balls are going to be reflecting light onto each other, the dark one will give out the least amount of light. What about the green one? It will give out more light than, than the gray one did. So that there will be some green light being reflected onto the reflected light section of this other ball. You won't see reflected light affecting the light section, this section over here, because reflected light is so weak that at its brightest, it's still not bright enough to overshadow even the midtones of the light section. I hope that wasn't confusing. Like we said, this gray ball won't reflect enough light to show up on this green ball. And so for that reason, the only reflected light that will be easily visible on the green ball will be the light coming in from the yellow ball over here. So let's paint that in. So that's how these balls will interact with each other when they're hit by light. So next up, I'll show you what happens when the light is moved around. Say so we have a light source here coming in from the side. What's going to happen is this ball is going to be illuminated in, uh, in this way. So just picture this one. This time I'm going to flip it. So if light was coming in from the side, this is what you'd have. Just assume this arrow is not a light source, but just an indication of the direction of the light source. So I'm assuming we have parallel rays in all these examples that go above and below this arrow. So now let's move our light source somewhere here. So we have the arrow coming in from this side, yeah? So now the light is coming in from a three quarters view, something like this. Like we said in the beginning with the first sphere, the light rays will stop hitting this object at the very middle. So from somewhere here, the light rays will stop hitting the surface. So this, none of this part will have any interaction with the direct light rays. All the interaction they'll have, if at all, will be with the reflected light rays. Except if we're looking at it from a three quarters view, then the transitional point won't be a straight line as it was in this case over here. The transition will be something of a curve, something like this. But what's important that you remember is that the division where this terminator is, remember the terminator? That was the section that divides the core shadow with the midtone will always be in the middle of the object. So even if you're looking at a moon, whether it's a crescent moon, whether it's a gibbous moon, whether it's a full, um, okay, a full moon is, you know, uh, the sun is somewhere here. So the light is actually coming in from the middle, so that doesn't count. But whether it's a, um, it's a waning crescent moon, it's a gibbous moon, or it's a waxing crescent moon, these points are always going to be in the middle, such that if you connect it again from the back, you're going to have a complete circle. It's never going to be just a slither of light over here. Unless we're talking about a really tiny light source, like say a candle. If we had a candle over here, then of course it would only light maybe something up to that section. But as long as the light rays are hitting this object parallel to each other, the terminator will always be in the middle. So we've already identified where the core shadow will be. So next up, I'm just going to pick a lighter version of this kind of green. The way I like to do it is to start with the midtone, not starting with the highlights. As you can see, most of it is covered because we're looking at it from a three quarters view. Then it's going to get brighter and brighter until you get to the point whereby the light rays from our light source are hitting this ball perpendicularly. So actually, this is actually something that's interesting. I figured I should probably show you. So you're gonna get your highlight in the middle. We've already painted this really bright section. So I'm assuming this is a highly reflective ball. Just assume it has like a glossy surface. Sometimes, in addition to the highlight, you'll also get a reflection of the light source itself. I don't confuse this for the highlight. Or if this, let's say it's a bowling ball, was in a room that had many lights, you could see other reflections of other lights all across the ball. 
And so these are not highlights, these are simply reflections. Actually, those reflections look kind of cool, so I'm gonna leave them there. Then go ahead and paint in our core shadow. Remember the way the core shadow behaves? It's going to be the darkest part of the shadow. Just paint in that section over there. Then I'm going to pick my eraser and get rid of all the excess. To get rid of all this stuff. Okay, so in this case, what we've just done was we've painted in the highlights, we've painted in the midtones, we've painted the core shadow, but you can't see the reflected light because it's going to be on the other side. If we took this light source and instead moved it to the other side so that it was coming in from such an angle as this, then what we're going to have is this ball over here. You see this? And so what you can tell from this example is if you find yourself drawing a sphere and light is coming in from the side, if you do this, yes, you will roughly indicate the direction of light, but this will not be accurate. The only way that this would be accurate would be if light is coming in from an angle like the one we just described with this arrow over here. So as long as light is coming in from the side, like we saw with those other examples earlier, the terminator is going to be perpendicular to the light rays so that all this section is going to be in shadow now let's try and apply these principles to shading a human face so this is the head let's make it a three quarters face so again we're looking at the face through a three quarters angle not directly from the front in which case the middle of the head is going to be somewhere here if you're thinking of a way to shade something like this it would help to first divide it into planes just like we talked about earlier so you'll have a plane for the face over here say a plane for the cheek a plane somewhere at the top one for the temple or the side of the head and of course you could go even further and add a few more for other sections then what's going to happen is if the light is coming in from this direction that would mean this plane will be a dark one and so will be this one if there was another plane here it would be a dark one as well you don't even have to draw these planes you can just imagine them and this will help you figure out how light will behave around your object. And I know this isn't an accurate one, an accurate face. We're gonna draw a better face very shortly, don't worry. But this is how you can use planes to kind of imagine just how to light your figures. Okay, now let's get rid of this mess and draw an actual face. So if this is the head. Okay, I'm gonna draw two of them. So one of them will maybe three quarters and another one will probably be like a half a side view sorry not a half view so this is the plane for the face once again right which means the eyes socket so it'll be somewhere here so that places the eyebrows somewhere around this section the nose is usually going to be halfway from this line then you could have like an eye somewhere here same this is the mouth the chin over here then this is the jaw the length of the ear is going to be from the top of the eye to the bottom of the nose we have a temple here oh, sorry is it a temple a cheekbone somewhere there and the second eye i'm having trouble placing this eye i don't know i'm just going to drop it somewhere there and maybe let's give this guy this kind of hair And just paint over this figure with lines that are a bit clearer so that when you start shading them it will be easier to tell which lines exactly i'm following I'm going to give this person something called the local color. You can think of it as the skin color, 
but it's painted as though light hasn't yet affected our character in any way. Let's make it something like this. And as part of the local color, I'm also going to paint in the color of the eyes and the color of the lips and that of the hair as well. Let's bring light from this direction. So how will he look like? You won't just have a bunch of white highlights all over this figure. That's not how light works. Most of the time what's going to happen is I'd like to start with the midtones for this one. So I'm going to start with this version of the midtones. So in this case, as you can tell, I've shaded this part of the forehead and this other part over here. Then it's going to be the nose as well. The cheek is going to be slightly bright as well. This other cheek will probably get a little light. So the highlights are going to be part of the midtone. So in small sections of the midtone that are being hit by the light perpendicularly. Remember up here, these are going to be our highlighted sections. Once again, I'm not using the color white itself. I'm using a bright version of his skin color, of the local color, remember? This is the light direction. So just imagine the, those parts of the skin that are raised facing that direction. That's where we're gonna get our highlights. Some of the chin as well. It's going to get a highlight. And really that's it. Uh, sometimes you may find yourself overdoing this kind of stuff. Try not to overdo it. Uh, keep it really simple. I think after the highlights and midtones, we can now move on to the shadows. All this section is in shadow, right? So I'm just gonna paint over it, over all of it really with shadow. Then I'll start to get darker bit by bit. So maybe the temple over here is going to be slightly darker. Just imagine how the skull looks like. You don't need to know about the skull in detail to know how to draw anatomy, but if you have the time, you can just look at it a bit and it will help you to know how to shade stuff like this sometimes. So the head is going to cast a shadow on the neck, right? So this part is probably going to be darker. And under the eyes, we also won't get a lot of light because the skull curves down there. Under the nose, we're also going to get some shadows. The lower lip will also cast a shadow on the chin. Then we could darken some sections that won't get any light at all. Those parts are incomplete shadow, like the inside of the ear, that part of the cheekbone, just a little. The temple, under the eyes. I'm just gonna use black for this one. Again, you can start from the shadows and move on to the highlights, or from the highlights and move on to the shadows, whatever you're comfortable with. As you can see in this example, I've shifted. So for the skin, I started with the highlights, but for the hair, I've started with the shadows. What about the highlights? These are going to be the highlights, very little. Skin doesn't reflect, uh, sorry, hair doesn't reflect as much light as the skin because of the texture. Okay, are we forgetting something? We are forgetting maybe some sort of reflected light. So let's assume this light is hitting this thing on this other side of the character, then it's giving back green light as a reflected light. So which sections are going to receive the most reflected light? The parts that are being hit perpendicularly will be the brightest. So you can imagine that will probably be this chain over here. Uh, this this uh, part of the nose. The ear lobes are probably going to get some of this. There isn't a formula for figuring out how this works. A lot of it is just imagining, but if you have an understanding of how light works, it becomes kind of easy to know how to do this. Yeah, let's make someone else face this other side. So we have a head over here. Maybe this is going to be the chin which would mean somewhere close to the middle we'd have the eyes and so the nose would start somewhere there we'd have the mouth here
yeah, let's say this person has some sort of funny hairstyle. Actually, it's not funny. It looks pretty good to me. Okay, so now we have a figure. Now, how are you going to light this person? All right, let's try and picture this. Let's start by our local colors, just like I did with the previous person. But in this case, let's change the skin color to something different. Yeah, let's give him this color. Then let's make the hair again very close to the color we used for the first character. I wasn't thinking of the gender when I was drawing, but I'm just gonna call her, call this person a half, a she from now on, because the more I draw it, the more it looks like I was drawing a woman, but I had no idea. I was just drawing facial features. Yeah, let's make them red, it's completely red like that. Why not? Then the eye color will probably be another kind of cream. So let's go back to yellow, white, cream. There you go. So let's bring in the lights this time from this direction. I won't go crazy with the highlights this time. I'll try not to. I keep painting with this color in all the sections that I think are going to be brightly lit. This part of the forehead. The highlights are going to be part of the mid-tone. So for the highlights, I'm just going to identify those sections of the mid-tone that I think are perpendicular to the light source. Then I'll make them a bit brighter. So here come the highlights. I don't know if they're going to be visible. But you'll get the point, I hope. The same thing will happen for the lower lip especially. We're gonna have this sort of thing going on. Now let's paint in the shadows. Which sections will get the least amount of light? Give us some sort of cheekbone. Then an even darker version will show us the sunken regions. going to try and paint in where different things cast a shadow on each other like where the ear casts a shadow on the neck or the back of the head so again the light is coming in from the front right so all this is going to be in shadow so you can see like even for this kind of strand of hair I'm trying to shade in the sides facing the back of a head not the whole thing because once again remember how we shaded our cylinder here so if this is a strand of hair it's this side of that strand of hair that's going to be or that tuft of hair that's going to be shaded back so that's what I'm doing in this section I'm going to do the opposite thing for this other side and just paint in the section that are going to receive a lot of light from our source and as I'm painting it's especially for hair, I'm going to try and show some sort of texture so they're not just as smooth as the way I was painting the skin so there's maybe some texture here that shows that it's, uh, that it's hair and not skin anymore then I'm going to do the same with this one there you go, I think this looks good and uh, you can then imagine if, if you like I mean this looks good to me, like I would probably leave it here but you could imagine if you wanted some sort of reflected light, where would it hit? So if the reflected light was kind of blue, maybe you would see it hitting uh, the back of the hair, maybe in this case. Some of it would probably get that blue light. Uh, you'd probably get some of it in the back of the ear, back of the neck as well. This muscle over here, the cheekbone, um, not the cheekbone actually, because it's in the, just a mid-tone, it doesn't get affected by reflected light. But you get the point, don't you? Okay. Now let's erase all the excess stuff so that it looks kind of neat. So that's how you would apply these principles we've learned about in a human figure. Now there's one more thing I'd like to mention before I continue, and that will probably explain why hair is generally going to be darker than skin. Like I said, dark things, as with the case with this sphere, tend to absorb more light and reflect less and so less light reaches our eyes that comes from the hair than the brighter skin or if it was vice versa then of course the hair would look brighter so if this person had gray hair for instance or white hair or something like that then of course the hair would appear brighter because the whiter something is the more light it reflects so other than that there's another reason why objects can appear differently lit even if they have the same color something 
that's called texture. So let me zoom in and show you something. So let's say I've zoomed in to this section at the back of her head, okay? Let's say you had hair. And let's say you had skin. So let's say I've zoomed in to her forehead. Let's say you had skin in this other box. And you're looking at it from this angle. So this is your eye. Okay? Well, for you to see it, first of all, light would have to hit this object then bounce back into your eye, right? So let's say light is coming in from this direction. When it hits this uneven surface, it's going to be reflected in all kinds of directions. It's going to go there. It's probably going to bounce over here. It's going to bounce up. So these are many beams of light hitting this surface, but they're being reflected everywhere because it's an uneven surface. So there's no consistency when it comes to how exactly it reflects light. So only a few rays will probably hit your eye. Whereas if light is hitting this other object with an even surface, it's going to be reflected in more parallel rays. So more light will hit your eye, even though of course light will bounce off into all sorts of directions, but there'll be a more consistent uh, trajectory when it comes to how the reflected light will behave. So that's why even though you can find two things of the exact same color, sometimes one can give back more or less light than the other, and that's because of texture. All these shadows we've talked about so far are what are called form shadows. These are shadows that a physical object casts on itself. So in all these cases, all you've seen is how light behaves around a particular object. If this cylinder was a tree trunk, the shadowed side of the tree trunk would be the form shadow, but then the shadow that the tree would cast on the ground would be something else. So this is what we're going to be talking about in the next section. This is called a cast shadow. So in the next section, we're going to talk about cast shadows. Let's start with using a sphere, for instance. When you have light coming in from a certain direction, say from this direction, all this light is blocked by the object, so it doesn't actually appear on the other side, at least in our cross-section. What's going to happen is, let's say this sphere is sitting on a piece of paper. Since even the piece of paper is lit, this piece of paper will be clearly visible to us, but the part of this sphere that's blocking the light won't allow the light to come onto maybe a section like this behind the sphere. So this section then will be the cast shadow. It's the shadow that this physical object casts upon something else around it, be it the ground on which it stands, or if there was a wall or another object over here, it would also be somehow affected by that kind of shadow. Sometimes you'll see this kind of phenomenon whereby a shadow is really dark close to the object, then it kind of fades out the further away from the object you go. How does this happen and why does this happen? This object will also block some of the reflected light from hitting the paper. So if we had a wall back here, it would be reflecting light everywhere. And so what will happen is reflected light won't be able to penetrate some of these sections of the shadow. And so below the object, you may find that it gets a bit dark. That's because this part is blocking both the direct rays and the reflected rays. Now this section of a shadow is what is known as the occlusion shadow. It's not a separate kind of shadow, it's simply part of the cast shadow. Actually, you don't even need to know these terms, as long as you understand the mechanism of light and how it behaves around objects, that's enough information. These names won't be useful anywhere, ever. So, if you're getting mixed up, remembering reflected light, mid-tones, occlusion shadows, cast shadows, form shadows, all that stuff, don't worry about it. Just focus on the way in which light behaves, and that will be enough information. Other times, if the light from the direct source is kind of dim or diffused, so if this is the sun and it releases light all around it, and say these are some of the light rays coming in and they hit some cloud cover, the light gets diffused. So it doesn't hit the surface of the earth as strongly as it would have if there weren't any clouds around. So that's why on a hot day when there are no clouds, shadows on the ground will be really clear. Actually, sorry. In this case, because of where the light is, the shadow will be somewhere close to this. But on a cloudy day, the shadows won't be as dark. They'll be kind of diffused because the light coming in from the source, the direct light in this case, this isn't reflected light. This is still light from the sun, but because the clouds kind of disperse it and some of the light energy gets lost because it gets absorbed by the clouds, the amount of light that will hit these objects on the ground, be they buildings or humans, is going to be much reduced. So now you know how the cast shadows behave. Now how do you know what the length of the shadow is supposed to be? So that's what I'm going to show you in this next section. So let's say we have something like a pencil. 
standing on a piece of paper. So let's ignore perspective for now and just draw it this way. We'll cover perspective immediately after this. So let's say you have your light source somewhere here. So this is where the light is coming from. Even if you know the direction of the light, of the shadow, how do you know where to stop it? So there's a very simple way to do this. Imagine something holding the light. So in this case, let's imagine this is a pencil standing on a piece of paper that's on a table. And on this table, there's a candle. So what you need to do to know where exactly your shadow is going to be is to figure out where the bottom of this candle is. I mean, the candle is going to be a cylinder, right? So at the bottom of it, there will be something of this sort. So yes, it's covered by wax and stuff, but at the bottom of it is this kind of a circle. So that will be the bottom of our light, somewhere here. Then you're going to connect the bottom of the light with the bottom of our object, or imagine that connection. You don't have to use rulers every time you're drawing. Then look for the top of the flame or the middle, like any part of the flame really, no one will scrutinize you. And connect those two as well. Then where these two lines are going to meet, this is going to be the length of your shadow so your shadow will be somewhere here then you can fill it in however you want so if you want to have an occlusion shadow of course you will put those aspects of light that we talked about just now into consideration so think will this give us an occlusion shadow or will we have a constantly dark shadow so that's how you figure out the length which means if we move this candle somewhere here so this was our um, like if it was a longer candle and this was our light source and this was still the bottom it's still on the table how would we figure out the length we pick the bottom of the light and connect it with the bottom of the object. Then pick the top of the light and once again connect it with the top of the object. And our shadow in this case will be somewhere here. Other times you may have many sources of light. So you could have a candle here and maybe a really bright bulb somewhere here. So what will happen is these shadows will kind of cancel each other. So the shadow that is formed by light from the brighter source, like in this case the, this bright bulb, will be more prominent. So what will happen in such a case is this candle shadow will still be visible, but it will most likely be very much dimmed. So it won't be as prominent as this other shadow. So that's why if you're walking around and there are a bunch of street lights around you, you may see multiple shadows. Even if you move this candle in front, do the exact same thing. Just connect the top of the flame to the top of the pencil. Then imagine you're at the bottom of the light source would be like even if it's a bulb of course a bulb wouldn't have something like a mast a, a, a pole that holds it so you can just imagine where the bottom of the bulb would be or rather where the bottom would hit the floor whichever floor is at the same level as your pencil if it's a table fine if it's the floor itself fine then just connect these two and right there where these two are going to meet is where we're going to have our shadow so that's how you determine the length of a cast shadow now let's talk about how to determine it if you're looking at an object in perspective let's start with one point perspective so with perspective what happens is if you're looking at an object like um, a cube from the front this is what it looks like but if you start looking at it say from the side this kind of behavior will start to happen whereby the sides will appear as though they're going to meet somewhere in the back if you move your your vision somewhere above you may see something like this happening whereby the sides look as though they're going to meet somewhere at the back. But what's constant in this way of viewing this object is that you're still looking at the face head on. So we haven't tilted this face to look like this yet. And so all these lines tend to merge at one point. No other lines appear to be having such kind of behavior. So these horizontal lines will will stay parallel forever and these vertical ones will also stay parallel so the only ones that seem to be merging at a point in the back are the ones that are perpendicular to our eyesight so this is called one point perspective there's a bit more detail into how exactly it works and stuff you could check those out for yourself but i'm gonna show you how to create a cast shadow when you're looking at something through one point perspective then i'll briefly describe two point perspective and show you how to create a cast shadow looking at something through that perspective as well okay so Let's move on. I'm sure this video by now is long enough. So in one point perspective, you're going to start by something called a horizon line, which is normally going to be at your eye level. Then you, you could set a vanishing point. So now a vanishing point is the point I just talked about a few seconds ago, whereby all the lines appear to be meeting at. But like I said, that doesn't affect how we're looking at the object. So let's say we're looking at a cuboid. The front face doesn't change, so we don't even need perspective for that. To figure out where the sides are going to be, we're going to need perspective now going forward. So I'm going to connect all of these corners with the vanishing point. 
That's not perfect, but I don't even care at this point. So let's say I want the cuboid to end here. That means this will be one side, this will be another side. The horizontal side at the back will stay horizontal, but then this one will connect with this line over here. All the lines that are perpendicular to our eyesight appear to be merging at one point in the back, that vanishing point. Let's imagine a light source. Let's say the sun is somewhere here. The horizon line could actually be an actual horizon. So just to illustrate that a bit better, I'm gonna add a few hills. So how will you figure out where the shadows of this cuboid are going to be? What you need to do, if you remember at first I said you need to find out the bottom of the light source. In which case we had a candle so it was easy because you just find the bottom of the candle and connect it to the bottom of the pencil or the matchstick. But in this case it's the sun which is suspended in space so what's going to act as the bottom? It's actually going to be the point that connects the sun with the horizon line. So this right here, this is going to be the shadow's vanishing point. And what that means is, so assume this is a building. If you're drawing a building from your imagination and you're trying to figure out where the shadows are going to be, all you have to do is connect the visible corners of the building with the shadow vanishing point, which is the point directly underneath the light source, in this case the sun or the moon. And after connecting them that way, we're going to do the exact same thing we did with the candle. So we're going to connect those two. And where the blue lines and the green lines meet is going to be the end of our shadow. I should have connected it better because I feel I've messed up somewhere. Yeah, this one will end here. I didn't connect them well enough over there, so try to connect them as accurately as possible if you can. I messed up with the vanishing points because mine actually connects somewhere here as opposed to the vanishing point itself, so it looks a little off. But I'm gonna hope you'll be able to get the point. I'll try and do a better job with the two-point perspective, don't worry. They connect like that, and this section here is going to be the shadow. If you don't know this method, you could find yourself painting in shadows that extend much further than they should. So a shadow that extends to this level, for instance, is only possible if the sun is much lower in the sky, because then these lines will meet at a much further region. Okay, now let's talk about how to do this in two-point perspective. So we're just gonna start this with, uh, you know, with the horizon line, just like we did before. And then find our two points. This is a vanishing point number one. This is a vanishing point number two. All you simply have to do is, first of all, start with your object. Where do you want the object to be? Let's say I want the bottom of the object to be somewhere here. So this time I'm going to be accurate with the line, so don't worry, we won't have the same mistakes as we did before. So this is going to be the bottom of my object. Then if it's something like a cuboid, only these corners will be visible, right? One, two, three. We'll only see these three masts. I mean, we'll see the fourth one, but only the top, not the whole thing, right? So what I'm going to do next is paint in that visible corner. Then decide on a height that I want this cuboid to have. Let's say I want it to be just this high. Then what I'm gonna do next is connect this corner to each vanishing point. Then create vertical lines that start from the other end and touch our new lines. Then we're gonna connect the end of this corner as well with the vanishing points. So now we have our cuboid sitting on the ground. Let's imagine a light source somewhere here. Next up, we're just going to imagine a straight line that goes from the light source and touches the horizon line. So in this case, this is again the sun or the moon. This is not a candle on a table. If it was a candle on a table, we just do it like we did it before, whereby this imaginary line goes all the way to the bottom of the candle. So if the candle ends here, then this is going to be our shadow vanishing point. Right? Even if it ends way in front of our object, this is going to be the vanishing point. Then you're just going to connect them the same way we did and figure out where the shadows are that way. But in this case, we have a light source that's in the sky, which means this spot right here, once again, is the shadow vanishing point. So the next step is to connect the shadow vanishing point to the bottom of our object. Then we're going to connect the top of this light source to the top of our object. I still don't know if it makes a difference connecting the center or the top. And then what's gonna happen is the point at which these lines are going to connect are going to be the corners of our shadow. So if you're doing some sort of architectural drawing, or if you like to paint cities, or I don't know, some sort of street lights, buildings being lit and stuff like that, then this is important. If you don't, I mean, I don't paint this kind of stuff. If you're familiar with my channel, there's never been anything of this sort. I'm not a big fan of straight lines, to be honest. I'm only doing this for demonstration, but it's not my strongest suit. Anyway, so that's the end. That's the end of the shadow vanishing point, okay? 
There's just one more thing I would like to mention. Like I said at the start of this lesson, this video is a repetition of a lesson I gave at uh, the School of the Arts and Design in University of Nairobi. And at the end of the lesson, some of the students came up to me with questions about light and shadow. And one of them had made this kind of a mistake. So I think this is a good time to address something like this. Let's say this is a box, right? And there's an apple on this box. Now what this student had done is he had painted in the shadows of this apple on top of the box, which is correct, but then painted something similar as an extension to this shadow over here. How you end up with such a mistake is by not knowing how to figure out the length of cast shadows. What would have happened in this case would be that light from the sun or from whatever source would hit the apple. And with the apple, of course, you don't have corners, so it's a more difficult thing to figure out using straight lines. So a lot of the times with more organic shapes, like if you're painting even a human being, it's going to be mostly down to your judgment. And what's going to happen is, if you figure out that the surface of this cuboid is not long enough to accommodate the length of the apple, the remaining section of this shadow is just going to show up as a tiny section on top of this shadow. So it won't be a whole new apple as if there's another apple on top of it. No, it will be just the remaining section showing up right at the top like that. Let me see, let me see, let me see if there's something else I'd like to talk about. Okay, so I'm gonna make this one quick because it's the last thing I want to do. Let's say we have our light source somewhere here, okay? Let's say we have a pole over here. So in this case, we're talking about a street light, okay? So figure out where the the light hits the ground. So let's say the street light ends here. If it was the sun, it would end at the horizon line over here. But since it's a street light, it's obviously in front of the horizon. So in fact, let's paint in our heels again to help you figure it out. If it's the sun, the shadow vanishing point would have been somewhere along the horizon line, depending on where the sun is. But since it's not the sun, it's a street light, using this uh, section here, we're gonna find uh, the length of the cast shadow by connecting the bottom of the street light to the bottom of our object, then the location of the light to the top of the object and painting in that new section as the cast shadow, right? Now there's a mistake you may find yourself making at some point where, whereby especially with something like a street light, since a street light is normally held by a pole, do not mistake the bottom of your light with the bottom of the pole because if you use the bottom of the pole your shadows are going to look different so you love shadows that connect the go like this as opposed to how they're supposed to go and also you may notice street lights normally cast a shadow on themselves right that's because if you connect a line from the bottom of the light through the bottom of the pole and another line from the very last light ray through the pole like that the street pole is going to cast a shadow it goes like this, behind itself. It wouldn't be able to do this if the bottom of the pole was here, which it isn't. So make sure the shadow vanishing point is directly underneath the light source and not underneath whatever is holding it. So if this was a person holding a light, the shadow vanishing point wouldn't be at their feet. It would be at, you know, where the light is. That's a terrible person, but you get the idea. Yeah, and with that, I think I think we're done, really. Maybe what is the only other thing, maybe a could do is give you guys a few sources like where did I get some of this information so there are a few videos I watched when preparing the original lecture and also for this video one of them was called uh, what was it called I think it is called Neil deGrasse Tyson describes the albedo effect there are some videos I watched some old videos from a channel called Moot DD drawing like these are videos from like 15 years ago but the information is uh, quite useful there's some videos where he talks about things like occlusion shadows, that stuff I was talking about. There's some science channels I was watching uh, that talk about the, the physics of light, like at the atomic level, what actually happens when an object absorbs or reflects or transmits light. I didn't include any of that info because it's just not necessary. You know, most of my drawing style and also most of the information like about reflected light and all that stuff is from a channel called Sikra. Sikra is one of my favorite YouTube channels and uh, Sikra Yasin is actually the name of the artist. He makes this really good drawing tutorials and in fact my drawing style is something of a combination of what I've learned from him and my painting style. So yeah, I would recommend these and more sources of course. Feel free to learn as much as you'd like to about light and about how it works in drawing and in painting. 
then there are a few artists whose work I would also recommend if you're interested in seeing people who work really well with light. There's an artist called, you probably know this name, some of these names, Rembrandt. There's an artist called Caravaggio, the goat. There's an artist called Artemisia Gentileschi. There's a photographer uh, whose handle is Kenyan Library. Check out how he photographs a lot of cats and coffee and books. I think he uses light in interesting ways and just low-key photography in general. I would, I would recommend checking out a lot of low-key photography. These are just things you could check out if you're interested in learning more about light or finding people who, uh, this is totally subjective. So these are people who I think, who I find interesting at least in the way they use light. So yeah, those are my two cents. You know, not entirely mine, but you know, stuff I've learned and information I've combined about light and shadow. I hope you found it helpful. If you stuck till the end, thank you so much for your attention and um, all the best with the drawing or your painting. And if you have any questions about this topic, feel free to leave them in the comment section. And um, if I can, I'll get back to you. I think I will be able to. But anyway, thanks for watching and see you next time.